Well, good morning. I love Psalm 103. Uh, We didn't read all of it this morning, uh, but what we did read affirms the goodness of the God who made us. It affirms that he wants only good things for us, and he has compassion on those who want compassion. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions. And the Lord is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. It's such an appropriate psalm for the message this morning on God's forbearance. Over the past few weeks, we have been looking at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, where we learn about our potential and God's character. My topic is the fourth forbearance. All these here, uh, these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit describe the God of the Bible. They are called the fruit of the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity. They were lived out by Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, and affirmed and demonstrated throughout the scriptures by the Father. As the psalm declares about the Father, he redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Therefore, we can confidently declare that God is love, that God is joy, that God is peace, that God is forbearing, and so forth. This is what God looks like. From this pulpit, we have been emphasizing time and time again the need for us to evaluate the God of the Scriptures, to ensure that we do not create God in our own image or have a distorted view of God himself. We look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who is the center of the biblical story, whose name is whispered in every biblical story. Jesus we can relate to. And here we have the Holy Spirit showing us Who God is through these fruits. Truly, what is there not to like? What is there not to embrace and discover about the one who made us? Can you not see that? In God, there is life. Without God, I have nothing to offer. And yet, we have this tendency... We we resist, we procrastinate, we ignore, we misunderstand, we replace God with ourselves and cultural idols. And in response, God forbears. That is what I want to talk to you about this morning. God the forbearer. So what does forbear mean? I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Some translations use the word patient, long-suffering, tolerant. Other synonyms are self, uh, self-restraint, endurance, refrain. And these are all good. But if you look at the dictionary, there is another nuance to the meaning. It can also mean refraining from the enforcement of something or to hold back. Now, some of you during this epidemic uh, may have asked the bank to allow you to postpone your mortgage payments for those of you that own, are fortunate enough to own homes. Uh, there is such a thing as a forbearance mortgage. So the bank allows you to have the breather for a few months during this difficult time. And it is patient in receiving its money. But at some point, it wants to be paid back and paid back with interest. After all, it is the bank. But okay, let's not equate the bank with God. But this is an example of forbearing, refraining from enforcing 
foreclosure. In Psalm 103, it reads that the Father will not harbor his anger forever. His anger is his vehement revulsion to evil. And harboring is his holding back or forbearing, allowing evil to continue for a while. But we see God throughout the scripture forbearing in all of these definitions that I have mentioned. The Bible could actually be called the book of forbearance. And in the book of forbearance, we see God patiently dealing with mankind, choosing people who are open to him and working alongside them, even though they continue to mess up. We think of Abraham, we think of Jacob, think of Samson, Jonah, David, Solomon. The list is endless. He patiently deals with us. We witness his long suffering in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel as they stumble through each year oscillating between honoring God and rebelling against God we have talked previously about how God had to work with Israel this stiff necked nation he allowed slavery and polygamy for example all against what is good and right looking ahead to a day when the culture would realize that these things have no place in God's world. This is forbearance personified. We see God tolerating cultures that defy him, showing restraint holding back. Cities like Nineveh, even Sodom and Gomorrah, saying that he would not destroy the evil city if ten righteous were living there. It's another example of holding back or forbearance. So this is the book of forbearance. And all this begs the question, why? Why does God put up with us? Why does he put up with me? We find ourselves in all of these stories in scripture. But why does he put up with us? Before we look at the biblical story for an answer, we only have to look within us to find some clues. Because humans are image bearers of God, and we can learn a lot about God by looking at ourselves. Not that we are God, but every human being is an image bearer of God. We have the ability to reflect the character of God. All these fruits, uh, we have them inside of us. No matter who you are or what you believe. Now they may be distorted. They may be dulled, even buried inside of us because of our sin, because of brokenness, because of our suffering or our rebellion towards God. But they're there. And God through the Spirit can ignite them in flames of flourishing that blesses and blesses and blesses. So in our own lives, we find ourselves forbearing on many fronts. I'll give you a couple of examples uh, from my own life. So I am uh, an employer. Uh, and I bear, forbear with my employees. I only have five and a half. Uh, and I want to train them to do a good job. It takes patience. Uh, uh, and I want them to succeed. Why? Well, because if they do well, the company does well. And if the company does well, our clients are satisfied. They actually get pay increases. But there's more to it than that. The employees will gain self-worth, improve their skills on many levels, have a sense of accomplishment. They become better people. They feel part of a team. And then there are some employees who may be struggling with with their job and I have to restrain from letting them go and work harder with them to help them in the hope that they can grasp the job and do it well and if after a while uh, it's obvious that they cannot then they will know that too and they will need to find another job 
that fits their skills better, and hopefully I can help them with that. But all of this is forbearing because I want a better future. I want to better everything. I forbear with my grandchildren. I have six of them. Three girls, three boys. And we love it when they visit. Uh, and we love it when they stay overnight. Now with the boys, we like to have them one at a time. They're so delightful to have. But when you have the three of them together, it is a whole different world. And you need forbearance. Restraint from locking them in the closet or putting them in a barrel and feeding them through a hole. I was just joking. Just don't call uh, the Child Protection Agency. You know, I say, come on, boys. You know, love one another. Share. Let the first be last. And they look at you with, what? But they do love each other when it comes down to it. I was going to say when push comes to shove, but that's one of the problems. <laughs> However, we look forward to the day when sibling squabbling will be replaced by joy and goodness and kindness and so forth. So we forbear because we have hope that we can teach them to live well. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Especially the parents. So we forbear because we are doing so uh, because we want life all around to improve. We want to see a better future. We want to see that things are right and harmonious when flourishing is in full swing. So why does God forbear? Well, for similar reasons. If we look at the scripture's whole story, the mega story, we will discover that the future uh, that God is preparing is worth forbearing for. So I want to take about four minutes to run through a diagram that lays out the mega story. And I got this diagram from one of my favorite pastor professors that I love, Daryl Johnson. Daryl is a pastor, professor at Regent College, a super teacher. And he wrote the book on Revelation, Discipleship on the Edge, which we studied as a church a few years ago, one of the best books on understanding Revelation. And when he teaches, he wants us always to have the mega story in our minds so we know where we are within the biblical story. You can actually find this explanation on YouTube, and I'm going to steal it. I'm going to plagiarize because it's worth the price of prison. I don't think he will mind if I use it. And these diagrams, they help, will help us see the forbearance of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now, Christians have a diverse view on how the end happens, but, you know, we all agree that God wins. So let's put the first uh, diagram up on the screen. So the first diagram is the story seen through the eyes of the Old Testament prophets. The white line is history. So we start with the creation of heavens and earth. They always go together. You can't understand earth unless you understand heaven. And it's good. It's very good. But then the line drops to a lower level of living when the fall happens. Humanity wanting to replace God with themselves, disobeying and everything collapses. Things don't work the same way that they were meant to. It's a lower level of existence. But God doesn't abandon us. There is grace right from the beginning, as demonstrated by God providing coverings for Adam and Eve, as they discover for the first time that they are naked after they sinned. And on this lower line, we have the salvation project of God which will require God's forbearance in spades. The fall results in God stepping aside because that's what uh, mankind wanted. And sin creates a barrier now between humanity and God. He hasn't disappeared, but a void is a result of the fall and that allows evil to move into the neighborhood and influence a rebellious humanity. 
However, we know from the Genesis story that God is going to put all things back together. The seed will crush the head of the serpent. Evil will not win. So on this lower line of history, we have the Salvation History Project. We have the stories of Abraham and Sarah inaugurating a nation that God wants to form so the whole world will be blessed. We have Joseph. We have the Exodus. We have the kings. We have the prophets who write and long for the great and terrible day of the Lord. History is moving directly to that great day of the Lord, where God drastically intervenes, judgment occurs, and out of the old heavens and earth is birthed new heavens and earth, which is even better than at the beginning. We're not going back to Eden. We're going to a garden city. And so you notice that the line is higher at the garden city at new heavens and new earth, because it's even better than Eden. There, the kingdom of God is now in its fullness, and the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in among human beings. That's what the prophets are looking and longing for. So in the second diagram, something completely unexpected happens. Jesus comes along. Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus now inaugurates this kingdom by doing things that were only to take place after the day of the Lord. That's why the Gospels, in the Gospels there is forgiveness, there is healing, there is the kingdom of God or heaven is talked about so much. That's why the Holy Spirit is prominent after the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then we read in Acts 216 in the last days I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people why new creation is beginning in Jesus followers who who are declared to be new creatures in Christ so biblical scholars tell us that the future is spilling over to the present and the life of heaven and the light of heaven is breaking in to the earth. It's not fully realized, but it is breaking in. And Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So now we are tasting the future and heaven. And it is good. Thanks, Pastor Johnson. For that helpful explanation of the mega story. When you see the big picture, perhaps we get a better understanding and glimpse of why God forbears. He loves us, will not abandon us, will in fact pursue us, and will forbear because the future is worth dying for. You are worth dying for. The future is worth all the suffering. The wicked may win for a season, but there is an end that justice demands. So we trust and we leave matters of judgment to God and focus on being involved in what God is doing now in these days, which we refer to as the last days, which are the days between the cross and and the great day of the Lord. And we focus on emulating Jesus and living out all these fruits of the Spirit empowered by the Spirit of God who comes alongside a repentant humanity. Yes, kindness and patience is intended to lead us to repentance. God's forbearance, though, is not limitless but it is so patient I love how the message puts 2 Peter 3 8 and 9 don't overlook the obvious here friends with God one day is as good as a thousand years a thousand years is a day God isn't late with his promise as some measure lateness he is restraining himself on account 
of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's given everyone space and time to change. The call is to come to him because in him is life. In him is love and peace and joy to its fullest. So I was thinking about a story. Um, And about three years ago, um, I should know the dates, but I'm sure my wife uh, will tell me that I'm wrong. But we always wanted to go to New Zealand. So uh, we went to New Zealand, and it was during that trip that Diana became ill. Uh, She had swelling in her stomach, swelling in her legs, and uh, I had to take her to emergency. So I took her to emergency, and the doctor there said, I think she has lymphoma. You better get her home. So the next day we flew out from... uh, From New Zealand, it took us over two days to get back to Nova Scotia where she got diagnosed. And yes, she had uh, B-cell lymphoma, which is a chronic form of cancer. Um, And uh, it's manageable, uh, but she had to go through chemotherapy and so forth. So because we've been away for a long time, we hadn't visited Diana's dad. Diana's dad was in the veteran's hospital. He had suffered a severe stroke. He couldn't walk and he now lost his his short-term memory. He had no idea what was going on. And Doug was a a great businessman. He was such a man of his word, uh, such a great example for me as a a business person. Um, But he always had questions about God and he always struggled with, with questions about God. But amazingly, in this, um, uh, the way he was now in a wheelchair, he became extremely peaceful, at rest with God. It was an amazing thing to behold. And he would tell people all the time that they're beautiful, that God loves them. And uh, he had a great effect as a witness for Jesus in the state that he was in. He Hadn't seen us for a long time. Of course, he wouldn't know this because of his short-term memory. And so as we went in the room, the room was quite dark. And in the middle was Doug in his wheelchair. And it was just a picture of peace. And as we entered, he lifted up his eyes. And he said, oh, it's so nice to see you. And then he said, Diana. He says, everything is going to be all right. And then he said, and you, Graham, he said, don't give up. And I just, it was a message from God. And you know what? It wasn't until, actually it wasn't until this morning that I realized that what he was saying is, Graham, forbear. Forbear. And I needed to hear those words. I needed to be reminded that life, no matter what our circumstances, is joining in what Jesus is doing, allowing the future to spill into the present. And I needed to be reminded um, that who I belong to and where there is true meaning and where true life is found, no matter what the circumstances. Hmm. So I want to I wanna just thank you, Lord, for bearing, for, for bearing me and, 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 and continuing to do so. And you are calling me to be forbearing as well. So help me be forbearing so that your love can flow out of me into a broken world. It's always our hope here at Grace Chapel, that these truths of Scripture resonate with our life, encourage us to call on God to change us. So I just leave you with a question. 
What is God forbearing on your account? And I have to ask the same question. What is he forbearing on my account? May we have the courage to stop and evaluate what on earth are we doing? And where is God at? May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.